the, the 50th, that's the very last chapter, the 50th chapter of the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 50. So thankful to see you today. I know that there's some that are listening through the transmitter that we can't see, but we're thankful that you've come. And, uh, I know that we would all like to be together in the building, and uh, yet I believe the Lord will bless you if you're sick, and I know some of you are, are sick, you're listening through the transmitter this morning, or, or whatever your case might be, I believe the Lord will bless you for putting forth the effort to come, even if you can't be in the service with us, you put forth the effort to come to the Lord's house, and uh, we know it's a poor substitute, but uh, it is a substitute, and uh, I believe the Lord will bless you for putting forth that effort, and we certainly pray that you can soon be back inside with us. Genesis chapter 50. I'm going to begin reading in the 15th verse of this chapter and going to read down through the 21st verse. That's an entire paragraph in this account. And uh, this is the, what I'm going to read to you is about a man by the name of Joseph and his brothers. And uh, I'll go back after I read and remind us of some things concerning Joseph. But, uh, I want to try to go a direction, a different direction this morning, one I've never tried to go with this passage, and I trust it can be a blessing to you, especially if you're here and you're unsaved, that uh, maybe this morning that you can see what it, maybe the hindrances that are keeping you from Christ or something could be said that could uh, help you this morning and before you leave today that you could get uh, your business fixed with the Lord. Genesis, Genesis chapter 50. Verse 15. And when Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, they said, Joseph will peradventure hate us and will certainly requite us all the evil which we did unto him. And they sent a messenger unto Joseph, saying, Thy father did command before he died, say, So shall you say unto Joseph, Forgive, I pray thee now, the trespass of thy brethren and their sin for they did unto thee evil and now we pray thee forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of thy father and Joseph wept when they spake unto him and his brethren also went and fell down before his face and they said behold we be thy servants and Joseph said unto them fear not for am I in the place of God but as for you Ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass, as it is this day, to save much people alive. Now therefore, fear ye not. I will nourish you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spake kindly unto them. I think most of you here this morning could probably, if you were willing to do it, could get up here and you could tell us about the story of Joseph, how that he was born into a family, and, and he had uh, older brothers, and he had a younger brother by the name of Benjamin, and there were 12 sons in this family, and their father, Jacob, and uh, of course there were several mothers in the family, Rachel and Leah and the, the two handmaids. And we know that Joseph was a favorite son of Jacob. And how that Jacob, his father, made that known. It was not a secret. And he made him a coat of many colors. And that Joseph's brothers were envious against him because of that. And you can see how they would be. And yet they took it too far. That as Joseph would be sent of his father uh, to where that they were keeping some sheep, that they would see him coming afar off. And they would have in their minds to slay him, to kill him. And of course, that I believe it was Reuben that stepped up and say, said, no, let's don't do that, but uh, let's sell him to these people that are coming through and throw him in a pit. And then that he would be sold to those Midianites that would pass through the land. And we know that Joseph was sold into slavery. Now, I'm not going to just take a lot of time with this this morning because you know the story, but he would, be go, he would go down into Egypt and that he would be sold to Potiphar, who was the captain of the guard of Pharaoh. And 
the, the accusations that Potiphar's wife would make against Joseph that were not true, and then he'd be cast in jail. And it would be there that he would interpret dreams of two men that were uh, servants of Pharaoh, and that one of them would be restored, one would be killed. And the one that was restored, that he would tell Pharaoh, Pharaoh, Pharaoh would have a dream that he couldn't understand. And he would mention to Pharaoh about that there was a man in prison that interpreted our dreams, maybe he can interpret yours. And Joseph was brought before Pharaoh, and he would interpret those dreams that Pharaoh had, and that, uh, of course, there would be seven years of great uh, prosperity as far as uh, the crops were concerned. There would be seven years of great famine. And Joseph would be put in charge, be second in charge in Egypt. And he'd be put in charge of gathering up the things, saving the things in the time of plenty, uh, and then uh, distributing those things in the years of famine. And we know that over a period of time that as the famine would begin, that his brothers would be sent to their father down into Egypt to buy corn, and that Joseph would recognize them. They wouldn't recognize him. I'm not going to go through all of that story. It's an interesting story. I read it again this week. Uh, I mentioned several weeks ago about serving the Lord with purpose this year. I'm not, re not going to re-preach this, but let me just chase this rabbit for just a minute. I hope that you've begun the new year in reading your Bible with purpose. I hope you've got a plan. And I've got a plan. And in my reading that I, I read through this, these chapters this week, and uh, if, you're not, if you don't have a plan in your reading, your study, and your prayer, I encourage you to do so. But as Joseph would eventually reveal himself to his brothers, and then that he would have them brought down into Egypt, and there were 70 souls of the descendants of Jacob that would go down into Egypt. Now, you probably knew all that. Now let's fast forward from there. Do you remember how long they were in Egypt before Jacob died? Does anybody remember that number off the top of your head? I don't expect you to. It's not something we think about a whole lot, but Jacob was in Egypt for 17 years. I want you to just sort of remember that. If you hadn't been paying attention thus far because you knew it all, start paying attention now. Jacob is there 17 years in Egypt, and then he's going to die. And what I have read to you this morning uh, tells us about some events surrounding the death of Jacob, who was the father of Joseph and these 12 sons. And I want to ask you a question, and uh, I want to go back through the account and, and see if we can answer this question, and then maybe take that and segue into the main thought that's in my heart this morning. Uh, so 17 years go by between the time when they come down into Egypt and Jacob dies. Now, here's my question for you. What was it that prevented Joseph from retaliating against his brothers during those 17 years? Because Joseph's brothers had been cruel to him, hadn't they? And I, that, that's, that, that's really just saying it very lightly, they had been cruel to him. We know the things that they did to him. And we may talk some more of that later on. But what was it that prevented Joseph from retaliating against those brothers during that 17-year period of time? Let's see if we can find an answer to that. Go back to verse 15 in your text. And I'm going to go ahead and, t and share this with you before we read verse 15. His brothers believed that his father had prevented him from retaliating. Okay, so remember that question. What had prevented Joseph from retaliating? His brothers believed that it was the presence of their father with them. So when you think about that, Jacob is now dead. So what is it that's going to prevent him from retaliating against them now? So verse 15 says this, And when Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead... They said, Joseph will peradventure hate us and will certainly requite 
The word requite means repay, or we would say retaliate. That he's dead, that it's possible that he will retaliate, he will repay us all the evil which we did unto him. So, think about this in your mind this morning. You, you can read earlier up through this chapter, and what you see is there's a great funeral that takes place. Israel or Jacob, he has a great funeral. When I say a great, he has a large funeral. Pharaoh would send a lot of his people with him, and they would go back to the land of Canaan, and, and they would have a funeral there, and there he would be buried. And so when you think about those other brothers of Joseph, you would think that probably what's on their heart, what's on their mind is, well, we're, we're missing our father. They're thinking about him. But Brother Matt, they've got something totally different on their mind. They're not even, I know they are thinking about their father, but what they can't get off their mind is the fact of what's going to happen to us now. That our father is dead. And in their minds that it was him that kept Joseph from retaliating against us uh, all these years. And notice what they, what, what they say in verse 15, the end of the verse, and will, that he will hate us and will certainly requite us all the evil which we did unto him. What does that tell you about their conscience? It wasn't clear, was it? Y'all agree with that? Their conscience was not clear. They're thinking about all the things that they did unto their brother. And so this sin arises in their consciousness. And there's two things that that sin causes in their lives at this time. Brother Allen, the first one is guilt. They're still guilty. They feel guilt over what they did. But the second one is fear. There's guilt and fear that arises up within them as they think about this sin that they had committed against their brother. This is not the first time we see this guilt and this fear uh, in their minds and in their hearts uh, through this passage. Go back to chapter 42. If you would, hold your place in chapter 50. But go back to chapter 42. And I want to read a few verses here. Chapter 42. I'm going to put my bookmark in it. I can't find it. I'll just hold my hand there. Chapter 42. Chapter 42 is the beginning of this when they first go down into Egypt. And I'm going to just put it in my words. Brother Cody, they meet a man down there who is pretty ugly to them. They don't know who he is. They don't have any idea that it's his brother. He speaks roughly unto them. What does he accuse them of? He says, you're a bunch of spies. You just come down here to see the nakedness of the land. And all they're thinking about this guy is, you know, man, he got up on the wrong side of the bed this morning. This, this man's got some issues. He's got some problems. But let's read what begins to come in their mind when they come up against this man who's cruel to them and who is ugly to them. Verse 21 of Genesis chapter 42 and they said one to another, We are verily guilty concerning our brother, in that, he saw the anguish, in that we saw the anguish of his soul when, we, when he besought us, and we would not hear. Therefore is this distress come upon us. And Reuben answered them, saying, Spake I not unto you, saying, Do not sin against a child, and you would not hear. Therefore, behold, all, the, all his blood is required. Also his blood is required. And they knew not that Joseph understood them, for he spake unto them by an interpreter. You see this? As this man tells them, you're going to have to leave one of your brothers here, and, and you go back, and, and, you, and you bring this other brother you say you got back to prove you're not spies. Man, I mean, immediately they begin to think that all this is happening because of what we did to our brother. You reckon their conscience is guilty? They have a guilty conscience? They do, don't they? Their conscience is not clear whatsoever. And so that, that, that it's present with them, this, this guilt of what that they had done unto their brother. And when you think about uh, what they had done to him, the, the jealousy, that was how it started, and then the hatred. They committed murder in their heart. Had it not been for one of the other brothers speaking up and said, hey, let's sell him, they would have killed him. They committed murder in their heart. And then the statement that, that jumps out at me here in verse 
21, the end of the verse, it says this, that we saw the anguish of his soul when he besought us, and we would not hear. Therefore, this distress has come upon us. Let me tell you what I believe about this verse of Scripture. I believe that when those Midianites tied him up and put him in that wagon, I think they probably tied him up and put him in their wagon. I think as he went away, I think he was screaming for his brothers to come rescue him. That's what it sounds like. And I think that uh, he, he cried and he cried and he cried until he finally got, they finally got so far off that his brothers could no longer hear his cries. That's hard-hearted, isn't it? Hear your very brother crying and begging you to come save your life. And the Bible says they sat down to eat and they sold him to the Midianites. I'm always, Brother Kyle, I've had this picture in my mind. They're sitting there, sitting there eating their sandwich and potato chips. Their brother's going off into the sunset crying, begging for him to save him. And they do nothing. This has stuck with them, hasn't it? This sin has been with them from that day until the day they went down into Egypt. And so they say, all this has happened to us because of what we did to our brother. Now let's go back to, verse, to chapter 50. So that was 17 years before. Now, as we go back to chapter 50, we fast forward 17 years, and it's still on their minds, it's still in their hearts. It still bothers them. They're still convicted over this thing that they've done. And so daddy's died. So go to verse 16. I believe they put their heads together. They said, we've got to come up with some way to appease Joseph. We've got to come up with some way to, to, to settle him down where he won't kill us. Have you ever thought about this? In the position that Joseph was in, he had the authority to make their life miserable, didn't he? He'd do whatever he wanted to with them in life or death. But verse 16, and they, they sent a messenger unto Joseph, saying, Thy father did command before he died, saying, So shall ye say unto Joseph, Forgive, I pray thee now, the trespass of thy brethren and their sin, for they did unto thee evil. And now we pray thee, forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of thy father. I'm going to read the rest of the verse in just a minute. So Brother Nathan, those boys, they put their heads together. They said, here's what we'll do. Let's send a messenger down there to Joseph. And let's tell him that our father, before he died, that he left a request. And that request was for you to forgive your brothers. Y'all think Jacob told those boys that? He may have. I'm going to give you my thoughts. I think they have lying through their nose. I don't think that I don't think he told them that. But I think they were trying to come up with a way to, to save their own lives. So they say, Dad, you know, Daddy on his deathbed, he told us to give you this message, you, you forgive us. You forgive us. Notice the statement at the end of verse 17. And Joseph wept when they spake unto him. Let's come, we'll come back to that statement in just a minute. Verse 18, And his brethren also went and fell down before his face and said, Behold, we be thy servants. Do you remember what, it, what the first thing that made his brothers mad or, or jealous of him was? Remember he had some dreams? And one of those dreams was that they would bow down unto him. Said, We're not going to do that. This is not the first time they've bowed down to him. God's word will be fulfilled. But they go, and so think about it. I'm trying to paint all this picture in your mind. They've sent this messenger ahead, and now they all get together and just go to his house. And they get on their knees, and they bow down before him, and they say, Joseph, we will be your slaves. We'll be your slaves. We'll be your servants. What were they attempting to do? They were telling Joseph, we'll do whatever we've got to do to pay this debt off that we have to you. There, there's nothing any lowlier than becoming someone's slave. But they bowed down before and said, we're your slaves. We're your slaves. 
In other words, what they were saying was this. We'll be your slaves to earn your forgiveness. We'll buy it. Verse 19. Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for am I in the place of God? We're going to kind of skip over that verse. We may come back and look at that one tonight. Verse 20. But as for you, you thought evil against me. But God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. Now therefore fear ye not, I will nourish you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spake kindly unto them. I want you to notice that in verse 20, Joseph didn't just excuse them. He didn't try to minimize or, or, or make light of their sin or say, oh, your sin, it, it wasn't a big deal. Notice what he said. He said in verse 20, you thought evil against me. You sinned against me. But he said, God took that and he turned it around. And he, and he made good out of it. And then in verse 21, Joseph assures them of his forgiveness. He said, I'm going to care for you. I'm going to nourish you. And he comforted them. And he spake kindly unto them. Let's go back to the question I asked you to start with. What was it that prevented Joseph from retaliating against his brothers? Was it the presence of his father? It had nothing to do with that, did it? Nothing whatsoever to do with the fact that Jacob was alive and that Joseph was just, you know, didn't want to hurt his father and he was going to wait until his father was dead before that he retaliated against them. Now, as I said, let's go to another side of this uh, for just a minute. As we said, for the past, it's been about 30 years since they sold Joseph into slavery. For the past 30 years that these brothers, that they've carried great guilt, they've carried great conviction, they've carried a knowledge in their heart that what they did was sin, that it was wrong, and that they have sinned against their brother. They've carried that with them for 30 years. But what about on the part of Joseph? What about on his part? Was Joseph reconciled to his brothers? Was Joseph at peace with his brothers? From Joseph's standpoint, was Joseph at peace with them? The answer is yes, isn't it? Joseph was at peace with his brothers. He, he was not in enmity with them. He had, he had become reconciled to them. Go back to chapter 45. Let's read a, a few verses here. When they would meet. Joseph's a wonderful example of forgiveness. He's a type of Christ and what Christ did that he forgave his brethren. But in, in Genesis chapter 45, I don't know exactly when Joseph was reconciled to his brothers. When he, when he put away any animosity, any hatred, any bitterness, and he forgave them. I don't know when that was. I don't know if it was when he was screaming and begging for them to, to come and help him as he was being carried off by the Midianites. I doubt it was then. But at some point over this, this period of time, Joseph had become reconciled to his brothers in his heart. In his heart. Genesis 45. This is when Joseph can no longer keep back from his brothers the fact that I'm Joseph when he reveals himself to them. Verse, verse 1. Then Joseph could not refrain himself before all them that stood by him. And he cried, Cause every man to go out from me. And there stood no man with him, while Joseph made himself known unto his brethren. And he wept aloud. And the Egyptians and the, and the house of Pharaoh heard. And Joseph said unto his brethren, I am Joseph. Doth my father yet live? And his brethren could not answer him, for they were troubled at his presence. And Joseph said unto his brethren, Come near to me, I pray you. And they came near. What do you think they thought he was fixing to do to them? They thought, thought he was fixing to cut their heads off, kill them. But he said, I'm Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. Verse 5. Now therefore be not grieved nor angry with yourselves. Notice that statement. I'm going to read that again. Now therefore be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that you sold me hither. For God did send me before you to preserve life for these two years 
hath the famine been in the land, and yet there are five years in which there shall be neither earing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So it was not you that sent me hither, but God. And he hath made me a father to Pharaoh and lord over all his house and the ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Had Joseph forgiven them at this point? Joseph had made peace with them in his heart. There was no animosity. Things were clear. But here's what I want you to see this morning. Can there be forgiveness? Let me put it this way. Can you be forgiven if you fail to accept that forgiveness? On the, on the side, from, from Joseph's standpoint, those brothers were forgiven, weren't they? But what about from their standpoint? They were not, were they? From the standpoint of those brothers that sold Joseph into slavery, they were not forgiven. And, and, and Joseph knows that, and he understands that, but because of the statement that he made in, in the very beginning of, the, of this of this passage that we just read in verse 5, he said, be not grieved nor angry with yourselves. He understands the fact that they're carrying guilt, they're carrying conviction, they're carrying a, a, a knowledge of, of the sin that they've committed. He says, you need to lay all that aside. I have forgiven you. I've forgiven you of that. I don't hold that against you anymore. You need to accept that forgiveness. You need to be reconciled unto me because I've been reconciled unto you. But did they? They didn't, did they? How do we know that? Well, back over in chapter 50. 17 years have gone by. And they send the message, and they say, Look, our, our daddy said before he died, Leave us alone. Forgive us. And then they follow that up by going and bowing down before him with their face to the ground saying, we will become your servants. This morning, how were they trying to get forgiveness? They were trying to earn it, weren't they? They were trying to earn forgiveness by serving. They were trying to earn forgiveness by repaying a debt that they owed. If you're, if you're in Genesis 50, let's go back to verse 17. I said we'd try to come back to this in just a moment, but, but let's read that verse again. As they send the messenger back, and, and, and you know, he says this, so shall, this is what Jacob said before he died, so shall you say unto Joseph, forgive, I pray thee, now the trespass of thy brethren and their sin, for they did unto thee evil. And now we pray thee, forgive the trespasses of the servants of the God of thy father. And this is a statement I wanted you to see, the end of verse 17. And Joseph wept when they spake unto him. It hurt him, didn't it? For them to, to come and say, Look, that, that Daddy said, would, would you please forgive us? And we'll work for your forgiveness. We'll be your slaves. We'll try to earn your forgiveness. That hurt Joseph that he wept because in Joseph's heart and in his mind, he had already forgiven those brethren, and yet that they had failed to accept it and just receive it. Isn't that a picture of God's forgiveness that he offers? You see, those boys were aware of their sin. They didn't try to sugarcoat it. They didn't try to say, we haven't sinned. They said, we've sinned. We, we have sinned. They admitted that. But they said, we want to earn the forgiveness. We want to do something in ourselves to, to, to make you or to put you in a position where that you'll be forced to forgive us. But Joseph said, you can't do that. That forgiveness has already been granted. I have already forgiven you in my heart, and I'm offering that to you. Would you accept that? Would you receive that freely? You don't have to do anything. And in fact, you can't do anything. What I want you to do is just accept it. Just, just take the forgiveness 
that I offer you. I believe there's a lot of sinners today that they fail to just see that God's forgiveness is free. It can't be bought. It can't be earned. It's free. And until one will do that, until a, a, a sinner will just accept it. You see, what did they have to go by? They, all they had was Joseph's word that, that fear not. And he didn't just come out and say, I have forgiven you. But he let them know very clearly, you don't have anything to fear. I'm not holding that against you. What do you have, sinner? You've got the word of Christ. You've got his, his, his faithful word that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Look, that's saved and lost. God said, I'm not looking for you to do anything. I'm not looking for you to try to earn it. I just want you to receive it. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. I could quote this, but uh, everybody here in the house could probably quote it, but let's read it. Ephesians chapter 2. Only those who will admit that they're sinners and will confess that they can't do anything to earn salvation, only those can be forgiven. Let me say that again. Only those who will admit they're sinners and will confess that they can't do anything in themselves to earn salvation, only those can be forgiven. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. Some of the most well-known verses in the scriptures. The Bible says, for by grace. By grace. Grace means unmerited favor. It means you can't do anything to earn it. By grace. Are you saved through faith? Through faith. What is faith? Faith is belief. By grace, are you saved through faith. And that, that is salvation, not of yourself. It is the gift of God. Just like that those brothers had received forgiveness because it was a gift of Joseph. God offers you forgiveness as a gift. It is the gift of God. It's not of works. Why did God make it to where it was not of works? Because of what we read in the last part of verse 9. Lest any man should boast. There's no man that's going to stand before God in judgment with his chest poked out, thumb in his lapels, and said, I got here, I got into heaven my way. Won't be anybody like that. Because if that was the case, he'd get glory, wouldn't he? The Bible says there's one who stands as a lamb, slain before the foundations of the world, with nail prints in his hands and in his feet, and with the, the, the imprint of the uh, spear into his side, that he stands there, and all glory goes unto him. Not of works, lest any man should boast. This morning, God's forgiveness is free. It's free. I hope those brothers realized that. I hope that day as they went and they bowed down before Joseph and Joseph wept. And he said, you can't do anything to earn it. Many years ago I forgave you. Would you just accept it and receive it? I hope all of those brothers said, yes, we'll accept it. We'll, we'll receive it as a, as a token of your grace toward us. In the book of 2 Corinthians, we read that God has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. and He's given us this message, be ye reconciled to God. That just simply means that through what Christ has done, that God 
has accepted that. He's accepted that as the payment for, for the sins of mankind. And all God is asking men, women, boys, and girls to do is to receive it, to be reconciled unto him. Let's have a verse of a song this morning. That's the message that's on my heart. God.